Hey, this is John David, AKA the Mafia Hairdresser. Last week I told you about those wonderful years that my mom and I had together. The Judy Doyle shrink days was around 1984. So that meant that I and my mom had a really, really great relationship when I was an adult for about 28 years. What a gift. I want to add a quick statement about my mother, uh, something she said in one of those I gotta call my mom because I'm sad moments. I called my mom after I moved back from Toronto to Chicago because I was engaged to a nice Canadian man named who just fully broke up with me. And if you want to know that story in detail, you'll have to read The Glow Stick Gods, which takes place a lot in Canada, Toronto, to be exact. Or you can listen to podcast season two of The Glow Stick Gods in this stream. As you can tell, my life is pretty meta. I've written about everything I've gone through. This podcast is only the only one, I guess, where I tell you 100% truth. So I called my mom. I was really sad that I had once again become single. Um, and she said, you know what, honey? I married your dear father and we had a good marriage and we still have a good marriage, but it's not easy. And either of us could have made choices to not be together at any point in our relationship. And that would have been okay. It would not have been the same as it is now. It is just a different path that we did not take. But I wanted to say to you that You've had wonderful people in your life, and they're still all wonderful people. As an aside, my mom loved all my boyfriends because they were wonderful and they were all super smart. And then she continued. She says, they're just not with you anymore. Maybe because of the way you're doing your life that it doesn't call for being with one person for all your life. I see you and I see you're happy doing what you're doing and you're not sacrificing what you want to do or who you want to be for anyone. So, dear listeners, I told you that my parents told me once that they were proud of me. You know, a million times they did, but I got it. I was, that's a gift. But when my mother said that it was okay that I was single, it was so helpful to me because instead of flagellating myself or feeling down on myself or feeling sad for myself, I was able to think maybe I'm okay. And that may be my truth, but just like overeating or smoking or wanting someone to forgive you or you wanting a better relationship with another person or a better relationship with yourself, it does no good to make yourself bad or the food bad or the other person bad or the cigarettes bad. My mom gave me a little space in my mind to love myself for the way I've done things and for all the people who I've loved. And, and I would one day find out why I was single. I would figure it out if I wanted to. Um, so thank you, mom. I know you're still working on that one aspect of my life diligently. And listeners, I will talk about my mom fixing me up with a very wonderful man from beyond the grave. Very specifically, she said she was going to do that and she did, but that's for another episode. This is John David. I'm the author of the novel Mafia Hairdresser, a campy comedy crime novel based on the time when I was 21 years old and worked for a cocaine trafficking couple and a Chicago mobster in Los Angeles. I also wrote The Glow Stick Gods based on my time in the party circuit where I traveled around the world to the best parties with lots of my friends. Both novels are now podcast serials, season one and season two of the Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles, of which you are currently listening to. You can now listen to another one of my popular podcasts. It's called John David and Goliath. It's about the time I moved from Chicago to Boca Raton, Florida to get out of the looting and the violence. In Boca Raton, I got a dream job at the Boca Resort where they lied to me as well as thousands of other employees for over a year. And it cost me my home, my career, and all of my savings. All four of my podcasts are very unique and in this same stream. To know more about me or the podcast, podcasts or my books just go to mafiahairdresser.com and please follow me on social media i'm mafia hairdresser everywhere and please subscribe like share and comment at will in this podcast how i killed my mother i'm going to tell you well you know how i killed my mother
Now I'll start out by saying truth is not an absolute. So I will also tell you that I am 100% absolutely sure that I was the universe's and my mother's instrument in her death. That is my truth. And that is my spiritual belief. Now, let me tell you what ChatGPT said when I was having a discussion with it. If you didn't know ChatGPT, it's Microsoft's AI tool that does a million things. I use it to write most of my blogs in my website, mafiahairdresser.com, as well as generate some of the graphics that I use uh, at the YouTube podcast version of this podcast. I even had it write lyrics to a song that I was going to use in one of those episodes of this podcast before I scrapped all the episodes that didn't have anything to do with my, me and my mother. And I have not used chat GPT for any of what I have said in this podcast. I have asked chat GPT to look at a few episodes and asked it how I could make those episodes funnier, as in an Irma Bombeck tone, because I love Irma Bombeck. And once one of my reviewers actually said, I wrote like Irma Bombeck, love that reviewer. Anyway, um, what it did give me back did not sound like me, nor would I have ever used even one line of its rewrites. I say that because we are going to see a lot of AI driven writing in the future. And that will be sad for all of us because it doesn't have soul. But this podcast is not about me trying to open up discussions that will save or enhance the world with AI or chat GPT. I'm putting my soul into this and that's a good thing. This podcast is about my mother and me, but I had been chatting with ChatGPT about this episode. I wanted to know how illegal it was to assist someone who wanted to die and ChatGPT just stated the pat legal statement that I should check with lawyers. Then I told it I only wanted to know what it thought about the question, but only for literary reasons. Here's the discussion. I'll copy it and paste it and read it right now. So my question, if I provided a person who wanted to die the instruments to do that, would I be committing a crime in most states? Is not a legal question, I told it. It is a literary question. What I want to know is do some people think it illegal or unethical? And this is what ChatGPT says. It says, ah, I see. Thank you for clarifying. In the realm of literature and storytelling, the moral and ethical implications are of providing someone with the means to end their life can be profound and thought-provoking. While opinions in this matter may vary widely among individuals, there are certainly ethical and moral considerations to explore. Some may argue that providing such instruments could be seen as an act of compassion, allowing individuals to exercise autonomy over their own lives and avoid prolonged suffering. Others may view it as morally objectionable, believing that facilitating suicide goes against the sanctity of life and the duty to preserve it. In terms of the literary context, delving into these ethical dilemmas can add depth and complexity to your narrative. It allows for exploration of themes such as the limits of personal freedom, the consequences of one's actions, and the complexities of human relationships. Then the user said, and I'm the user, that's me. I said, I agree with your assessment with the literary benefits of looking at the moral and ethical implications of assisting someone's death at the bequest of the one wanting to die. Now I would like to be given some of your thoughts or situations that would be considered why doing so be negative or legal. I already comprehend and think of the positive reasons, I told it. ChatGPT said, Certainly exploring the negative of potential aspects, providing someone with the means to end their life can add depth and conflict to your narrative. Here are some of the considerations. Okay, now ChatGPT lists a one, two, three, four, five, and it did list legal ramifications. In some states, it is considered a criminal offense, uh, it says in many jurisdictions, for aiding or abetting suicide. So yes, it can be illegal. Uh, it says ethical concerns about coercion, 
there's a risk that the person providing the means for suicide may, may exert undue influence or pressure on the individual seeking to end their life, meaning if the person is vulnerable. This raises ethical questions about consent and autonomy, especially if the person is vulnerable or susceptible to manipulation. Number three on ChatGPT's list was the psychological impact. Providing someone with the means to end their life can have profound psychological effects on both parties involved. And number four, impact on relationships. Assisting someone in their decision to end their life can strain relationships and lead to feelings of betrayal or abandonment among family members and loved ones. And number five is lack of safeguards, blah, blah. There's a risk that vulnerable individuals may be coerced into making irreversible decisions without fully considering the consequences. And then I thanked ChatGPT and I said, you're very welcome. I'm here to help. I do love dialoguing with the ChatGPT. It's very interesting. So that was the discussion between me and an AI, and it gave me much to think about here. Now, let me get on with my story because I'll bring up some of the chat GPT's five points later, because by the end of this episode, I, I just know they're going to come up because they came up with me and uh, the whole thing's been haunting me all my life. I had just started writing a blog days before my mother called to tell me that she was going to go to the hospital for a minor surgery in less than three weeks away. The blog was going to be 50 daily chapters of me telling the world my experience of turning 50 in a pithy, comical, bitter, lamenting style. The last entry would be on my 50th birthday. At the end of the 50 days, I was going to edit my entire blog and put it out as a self-published nonfiction ebook. Through social media, the readers of my book, Mafia Hairdresser, and the sequel, The Glow Stick Gods, um, who knew those novels were basically nonfiction, were always asking me to write, um, just write about my life, my real life. And the 50 days of 50 book was as close to it as I felt comfortable doing. As much as I was all over social media, I was always a very private person. The irony to me now is that this podcast exposes the real me like I would never have done when I was still 50 years old and younger. My mom didn't make her surgery procedure seem like a big deal at the time. And I was like, mom, what? On the phone when my mom told me that my brother was flying out from Houston where he lived at the time. He opted to be there for her um, for her actual surgery. My brother was always so cheap consistently broke, and he had an evil bitch of a wife. If any money was going to be spent on an airline ticket, she would have certainly used up all those family travel funds for herself to fly to Cabo with her own girlfriends for a girlfriend weekend. I wondered how and why my brother got permission and money from his wife. And why was he flying out to Red Bluff, California from Houston to be at my mom's bedside for minor surgery? It's nothing, my mom assured me. How come Jess knew and I didn't, I said. And now he's flying out to be with you. I, what? Honey, mom wheezed. I didn't want you writing about my surgery in your blog. Mom, you're actually reading my blog? I was shocked. Mom, how did you even know I was writing a daily blog? Dear, you practically broadcasted it to the world. She did not sound accusing, just factual. You put it on everybody's wall. The whole family is reading it too. Really? And yet they've never seen the plays I was in or the plays I produced or read any of my books. I had announced that I was doing my 50 Days of 50 on my own Facebook timeline, Twitter, Google+, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Instagram, and Tumblr. And I had announced it in my latest email blast of 5,000 followers. Of course, it was bound to get back to my family, but I didn't think any of them would read it. And I had completely forgotten that my mother had recently joined Facebook at the time. In my first novel, Mavi Hairdresser, I wrote a novelization recounting of my coming out process with my mother, a minor part of the story. But that mother-son relationship in that book was funny, yet fraught with friction, much like my mother's and my real relationship. In that book of fiction, I practically vilified, slandered, and maligned my own mother, much like I've done here. But that mother and son relationship may have been funny, but it was certainly fraught with friction, much like my mother's and my real relationship. In that book of fiction, I practically vilified, slandered, and maligned my own mother, if one were to believe that what I wrote was actual fact. 
So maybe that was why my mom would have kept her private health and her surgery from me. But her point was well taken. I may or may not have written about her surgery in my 50-day blog. Mom, this surgery sounds serious, I told her over the phone. Just making a last-minute California trip? It all sounds so ominous. No, no, just, just wanted to come out anyway, she told me. You know, that wife of his. I never, well, I'll just stop there. Anyway, besides John David, we all know how fragile you've been lately. W what do you mean, fragile? Your blog, honey, it's kind of, well, sad. Sad? You think it's sad? The only thing I thought was sad was that my two best friends backed out on that motor trip to Dollywood and Cedar Point that I had been planning for a decade. And then I had lied for over 25 years that I was 11 years younger than I am. And that's because 9-11, after that, my birth certificate had to match my driver's license and passport. I was going to be forced out of the age closet sometime, so I thought I'd just write about it. <laughs> my heart bleeds for you, dear. At least it wasn't you who decloseted me this time, so I shan't be writing about you, Mom, again. There is a God. Now back to you. Are you sure, dear? Mom, are you okay? This surgery, really, it's no big deal. My mom had an autoimmune syndrome called Crest. Part of her disease was that tiny little blot dot clots formed and they could burst both inside her body and on the surface, but they can heal pretty quickly. And it's not gross or messy, it's just tiny little dots. My mom had only had minor complications due to these little bursting clot dots for the past decade. Sometimes Crest gave her pain in her hands when it got cold and sometimes she had a hard time swallowing. Crest is hard to detect and it is a multi-system connected tissue disorder but it won't kill you. I had a doctor in Chicago tell me that I probably had it, but that there was nothing to do, so don't worry about it. So I never did. Now, I have to tell you, up to the day my mother went into the surgery, she repeatedly stated that she always wanted to stay young and she never wanted to get old. And Crest disease withstanding, her body and mind obeyed the staying young thing. And I do believe in mind over matter. Mom always looked young despite smoking all her life and she stayed pretty. And she was feisty and fun when around family and friends. She was still young at 72. So, of course, I wrote about my mom's surgery in my blog. I'll excerpt here because it was maybe too prophetic that I wrote it. I mean, I have this diary of this whole podcast. It was there for me for the taking. At the very least, I had an intuition, maybe back then when I was 50, of things to come. You'll see. Listen. So, excerpt from day four of original blog called 50 Days of 50. It's all or nothing for her. She stated this to me in so many ways. Hell, she says the exact same thing. I love you, Mom, but I have to believe that if my mom believes that she won't get old, then she won't. I cannot say this more clearly. It's her life, and I have to respect that. I just have the feeling that something will help my mom leave earlier than I want. I don't know what that something is. I can't worry about her crest because I don't like feeling that is what is going to make her die too soon. To make matters worse concerning my mom's health, the woman has worked diligently to make her wish of never getting old come true. She won't get much older if she continues to smoke cigarettes and avoids exercise. I'm pretty sure her diet is not chock full of fruits, vegetables, and gluten-free foods. She's become more of a homebody, antisocial, and she's lost much of her lust for learning about the bigger world around her. After my dad retired, they moved to a nowhere place in Northern California called Red Bluff, and she hates it there. My dad is stubborn with his own health. I know she's tired of nagging him. You tell him, Mom would always say to me. I'm tired of telling him to cut down on salt. She uses the word tired a lot lately. And I can see why she's tired. I'm tired too. I would love to take a few years off from working out and eating right while the Kardashians constantly remind me that my life sucks. Who even wants to be part of today's modern society that communicates through text or on social media platforms? Like my mom, I thought life was supposed to get easier, not harder. And damn this aging thing. Maybe when I get to her age, I'll start smoking again, just for the hell of it. The more I think about it, the more I get it. Her life didn't turn out the way she thought it should have. Neither me nor my brother had kids, and my brother's two filled marriages caused mom a lot of pain. He's still in marriage number two, I think. But it's on its last legs. 
So that's the end of that excerpt. Several weeks later, when my mom went to the hospital for surgery and was still in the hospital, my dad called to tell me things were not so good. Mom went in for one thing, but it became another. She was going to have to have a piece of her lung removed. Dad said she had a good chance of surviving the surgery, but because she was a smoker and because of her age, it was her recovery that was in question. I stayed up all night booking my flight and rearranging my clients, their hair appointments. I drove myself crazy thinking about the what ifs and praying that my mom wouldn't die. My dad and I thought it would be a good thing if I was there at least a week after mom's surgery. My brother had already been there for a week and dad felt that I would have been better at making sure mom would do what she was supposed to do. You know, all the things the doctors prescribed and I thought those things would entail not smoking or maybe they would prescribe exercising of some kind or rehab something, eating healthy, of course, and taking her medications. Mom could be obstinate if she didn't want to do something she didn't want to do. She could be forceful. But I was a force too, like mother, like son. And since dad and my brother were not forceful like my mom and myself, they knew I would be able to bully, cajole, threaten, or wear my mom down so that she would do what was needed to get healed after that surgery. The whole time before I got to Red Bluff, I had a bad feeling. The uneasy feeling started before I heard that mom had to have a piece of her lung removed before I booked my flight out there. The bad feeling, or the premonition, started when she first called to tell me about the surgery on day four of that blog. Since that time, I had been worrying and blogging. The blog became more about her than me, turning 50, because, well, it was supposed to happen that way. At the time, I was getting into listening to meditation recordings during those weeks leading up to her surgery. It's all right. It's always all right. Everything always turns out right. That was like a mantra that seemed to speak to me in my meditations, as if those words were going to be the ones I needed to remember when things got bad. In between those meditations, my mind made up stories and scenarios that would hopefully not happen like my mother's funeral. Excerpt from day 31 of original blog called 50 Days of 50. There's part of me that doesn't want to bum you out by writing about my mom, but I couldn't get around not writing about her today. And so, as not to leave you hanging, my mom goes into surgery in a day or two after she builds up her strength with a few days of food and rest in the hospital. She'll be in the hospital for a week and then she will recover at home. I'll fly out for the first 10 days of her home recovery because that might be a tough time. I plan to be her cheerleader and hope that she uses whatever gifts she's been given to recover and then use the rest of her life to be as healthy and joyful as possible. But if she has other plans, I I know it's all right too. End of that excerpt. My mom obviously was reading my blog because she deleted a lot of her old Facebook posts on her wall that she had recently published leading up to her surgery. In part, she was kind of leery about Facebook. She thought it was pervasively public and she wanted her privacy. And I was certainly not giving it to her because of my blog. But we never spoke about that because by the time I got to Red Bluff, her privacy didn't matter to her anymore. Nothing mattered to my mom after that surgery. Nothing in this world anyway. I do believe that in one's life, one must analyze, take stock, and constantly review what your beliefs are, the spiritual ones. And after you commit to believing in those spiritual beliefs, you have to reinforce them into your reality when you are still healthy and when you are still alive. As I said, reality, like truth, is not absolute. You can change it, like you can change your beliefs, such as believing you will never grow old, as in you cannot visualize yourself wrinkly or hunched over or shrinking old. And when you state that I will never grow old over and over, that becomes a belief. And that statement said out loud is your consistent commitment to that belief, which I believe will become self-fulfilling. I believe if you believe that you will never grow old, along with you stating it out loud, that is like a jet-powered prayer sent to God's ears every time you think it or say it or prayer it. So you will never grow old. That is a reality. So mom had always said, I never want to get old. Another one of my mom's prayers or realities was that she never wanted to have pain. She didn't want pain when she was young, and she certainly didn't want to be in pain when she got old or older. 
She also had another specific prayer wish. Mom had always stated that she could not and would not live if she had a colostomy bag. She began to recite that one when my Aunt Grace, my godmother, had to have a colostomy bag at one point in her life. I couldn't imagine my mom with a Puy Vuitton bag for any reason. So it was not something I ever really thought about or worried about for her. I just knew that my mom would not have tolerated a Poopalooza because she saw what my aunt went through with one. Mom probably thought it was gross and it certainly would not have allowed her to continue to feel pretty, which was the addendum part of not wanting to get old. Mom was always pretty. Getting old takes away from pretty. But she was never going to have a colostomy bag, and she was never not going to be pretty, I thought. Those two things could not happen. (sighs) Thankfully, the operation was a success. The clotty thing in my mom's lung was removed, and she woke up from the operation breathing better than she had in years. Miraculously, the lifetime of smoking was not a big factor in her breathing at all, and she showed no signs of lung cancer. Her vitals were fine, and mom was not in any threshold of pain that she would object to. All things looking up. My brother flew home to his see you next Tuesday and soon to be ex-wife in Houston, Texas. And after a few days before my mom got out of the hospital, I flew to California from Chicago with my little terrier Junebug. I planned to stay until my mom felt good enough to take care of herself. And when the doctors released her from the hospital a few days earlier than expected, I thought I might even be there a few days less. What happened in the 24 hours after my mom came home was too horrific to blog about. I looked back on my entries in that blog and I did not go into the details that I will hear. This podcast will be the first time I describe the dreadfulness of my actions, which killed my mother and created the guilt that I have spent over a decade trying to forgive myself for. The doctor that spoke, mostly through my father, demanded that my mother stay awake in regular hours and go to bed at a reasonable bedtime every day from whence she was prematurely sent home from the hospital. Additionally, mom was to eat three square meals a day to regain her health and strength back. Mom was surprisingly strong when she arrived home with my dad from the hospital. She was in good spirits, and she enjoyed seeing my cute little shy Junebug, who was like a little furry feng shui energy ball scurrying around, stirring and moving the happiness molecules around her house. It was the eating thing that fucked everything up. Mom was hungry. She refused to eat her first meal at home and I was not able to make her. That was a skipped lunch meal. By dinner time, I had resolved to do what her doctors wanted her to do after my dad called the doctor to tell him mom was not hungry. The doctor insisted that she eat. The doctor wanted her to eat, and he insisted that she eat. My mom put up a fuss, but I won. And then shortly after dinner, mom told me and my dad that her stomach hurt, so she went to bed. The next day, she might have seemed better. I honestly don't remember that, when how she woke up. The day is still just a hazy memory, but I'm sure I made her eat something for breakfast, even if it was, even if it was just a little later in the day. Throughout the rest of the day, mom complained of an upset stomach. So my dad called the doctor again. And once again, the doctor stipulated that mom had to eat and that the irritation in her stomach would have been normal. I vaguely remember wheedling and lecturing my mom about how the doctor made it clear that she was to eat to build up her strength after the days in the hospital where mostly fluids were given to her. I definitely remember cajoling her by holding up spoonfuls of soup to my mom's mouth. Um, This made her a little angry, but at least I accomplished what I flew out to California to do, make my mom do what she was told to do by her doctor. But I was killing her, and I didn't even know it. Now, there's one thing about being a hairdresser for over three decades. Oh, my God, more now. Anyway, you hear a lot of stories. And I had heard a lot of stories about injuries, diseases, hospitals, and tragedies. So I was knowledgeable about this thing called ileus. It basically means that the intestines aren't actively moving food forward. And so if that's happening, you cannot eat yet. You get ileus after you've had anesthesia. After a patient is given anesthesia, their stomach and bowels don't work. So most patients are made to stay in the hospital until they have their first or second poop. 
Over the years of being a hairdresser, I have heard the personal stories from my clients who told me about their friends or loved ones who have died because of a ruptured intestine or stomach due to ileus. So I learned about Elias and I knew about this malady long before I flew out to California near my 50th birthday to take care of my mom after her surgery. And yet it never occurred to me that was what was happening to my own mother. By the evening of my mother's third night of coming home, my mother's intestines had ruptured. Excerpt from day 47 of original blog called 50 Days of 50. Last night, we had to call an ambulance, and we rushed my mom back to the hospital. I think I knew something was wrong on the second day that I was here. She complained of severe stomach pains. We called the doctor, and they said it was normal and to keep making sure she eats. So I forced her to eat the next two days. And this may have been a mistake. Excerpt from day 48 of original blog called 50 Days of 50. Mom's stomach had ruptured and they took her in for surgery. Her insides are pretty messed up and the doctors had to give her a colostomy bag. I can't believe I'm writing this, but it soothes my nerves and that's what I'm all about, soothing my nerves so I can feel better. When mom woke up this evening, she was intubated and she was surrounded by me and my dad. I kept thinking she's going to be so pissed when she finds out she has a bag. It totally goes against her. I don't want to grow old and have a baggy thing. After hours and hours, which seemed like days, mom began to become more coherent. Her doctors explained what had happened to her and that they would remove the bag when she got better. I could see it in her eyes. She was done. Excerpt from day 49 of original blog called 50 Days of 50. My dad and I talked to my brother on the phone in the past 24 hours. So many tears. Mom has a DNR, a do not resuscitate in her charts. But my dad didn't think that the life-saving stomach repair surgery and the temporary colostomy bag fit into that category. I'm not being self-righteous, but I don't think my mom would agree. She would say so if she could take the tube out of her mouth. Mom's physical body is only doing okay. She has internal infections from the stomach fluids and she must fight off those before she can begin to heal from this second yet unexpected successful surgery, this one being an emergency stomach repair surgery. I just don't think she's up for it. I know her. Mom only signed up for the first lung surgery. She agreed to that one. But if that first surgery put her in a lot of pain, or if she knew that she was going to be in for a second long-term convalesce or healing from it, she would have put up a fuss. She was already in the hospital a few weeks for surgery one, and she did not like it at all. It's a shame mom seemed on her way to recovery until yesterday when the pain in her stomach became excruciating. This time to the hospital is triple worse than the last. She doesn't have the pain she had in her stomach anymore because of the drugs, but I can tell she's miserable and I know what she's thinking. I'm out. She's always been an all or nothing gal. As dad and I were conferring with my brother over the phone in one of the ancillary hospital waiting rooms on my mom's floor, mom wrote a note to one of the nurses I had come to rely on to tell me things straight. Mom wrote that she wanted to die. The kind, life-experienced nurse took us aside afterwards and told us about the note. It's so weird, but I wanted to ask her for the note. Not as proof, but as a token. My dad was understandably inconsolable when he heard about that note from my mom. My brother on the phone was a mess too. I cried too, but inside my chest, I felt a steely shell and clothes upon my heart. This always happened to me when someone close to me was going to die. That's not to say I become unfeeling or that I'm trying to save myself from emotional pain. I just go into a mode of focus on what must be done for the person dying. That sounds so cold. Let me try stating this again. My imagined yet philosophically perceptible mental fortification around my heart is just reinforcement, if you will. I feel that my heart becomes stronger when I know I have to be strong for someone else. There, good writer. Today I feel the steel, and yet I feel deeply so much compassion for my dad and my brother. They will experience the good John David, not the selfish drama do bitch that they know me to be every other day of the year. I am feeling only love for my mother. I am love. I have become what my mother needs me to be, strong for her. 
My brother is flying out from Houston tomorrow, but it will be too late. I know it. My cousins Jill and Nicole and my mom's remaining live sister Dee and two of her three remaining brothers, Bob, Joe, and Joe's partner Steve, will drive here tomorrow too. They are all driving from the Bay Area. My other biological uncle Steve is too old to make the drive, but he lives in a different state. So Last night I was alone with my mom and I asked her, did she want to die? I asked her and she nodded yes. I suppose it was a formality I, I had to ask. It was part of the thing I had to do. Then I leaned into my mother's face and sternly asked if she was full of shit or just scared or if she truly wanted to die. She nodded. Final answer, mom, I said to her eye to eye. You better be sure about this. She nodded again, and that's when I wavered. I didn't want to be sure. Did she nod for yes? She was not sure about this, or yes, this was her final answer. So I told her to nod for yes and squeeze my hand for yes at the same time. This is your decision, I reiterated. Do you want to die? She nodded yes, and she squeezed my hand. Yes. I cried, but not for very long at all. That would have hurt her too much. Years ago, I once had what could be described as chronic pain in my stomach, and I turned to a quantum touch healer. Her name is Chris Houston. What she did to heal me was to spend an hour session every week with her hands over my stomach, and she concentrated good healing energy into my body. It's not magic. It's natural. In fact, anyone could do it. My vet told me to do it on my cat when she was suffering from diabetes. So I learned how to do it. And just a few days ago, when mom was still at home and she was suffering from the pain in her stomach, dad and I put her to bed. The swelling in her abdomen was intense, so I gave Quantum Touch a go on my mom, and after about 20 minutes, the swelling went down a little and the pain lessened. But later that night, we rushed her to the hospital. I mentioned the Quantum Touch session with my mom because while I was doing it, a visualization popped into my head. I had this visualization of a little girl roaming around the inside of my mother's body, telling me where I needed to place my hands for optimal healing. It was that visualization that I thought was going to help my mother have a smooth transition, as that was what she wanted. After mom had told me that she for sure wanted to die, I leaned very close to my mother's face again for dramatic gesture. I said, okay, mom, this is what you are going to do. You are going to find that little girl again, and she's going to take you to a light. And when she leads you to that light, I want you to run. I want you to run so fast and so hard towards that light, and I don't want you to look back, not even for a second. I knew my mom hesitated, like she wasn't really fully buying into the little girl visualization, but I was insistent. I wanted her to know that this was the key to her being able to metaphysically and quickly leave her sepsis and fatigued body. I told her again what I wanted her to do. Follow that little girl. Run for the door or the light, mom, I said. I mean it. I'm going to interject here for a minute. Again, everything you're hearing is a blog that I wrote 12 years ago. So one thing that I did not write uh, in this blog was that I told my mother that when my mom went through the light, her mother and father, as well as her brothers and sisters that had already died, would be there to greet her on the other side. I don't know if I didn't remember that when I wrote this blog. I don't know why I left it out. Um, maybe it was due to personal reasons. I can't remember. But I was reminded that I said that to her, that her her family would be there on the other side. And I'll tell you that in a story in a later episode, as I told you. So back to my blog. After the second time I told my mom to follow the running little girl towards the light, mom nodded, whether it was to appease me or to say she got it. Either way, I knew that she was on board. Mom was at least going to give my spiritual guiding visualization tool a big try. After all, it was my mom who passed on the mumbo jumbo to me. When I was a kid, occasionally she'd pull out ESP cards and she and I had dabbled with that sort of stuff for all of my life. By the way, with those ESP cards, they're called Zenner cards, we had a pretty good ratio of proper guesses versus wrong. And mom always claimed that she and her sisters always knew when the other was going to call or when one of the sisters was passing. Mom loved the mumbo jumbo and I hoped it would serve her this day. 
I promised my mom that I would handle everything out here, out of her body. I told her that I would make sure the doctors and her body would let her go and that there was nothing that they could do to hold her back. I would fight, if needed, to take her off any life-saving equipment. I also promised mom that I would make it so dad and just my brother would be okay and that she would no longer have to worry about them. She had done enough, I told her. In my head, I thought, Mom will never have to worry when Jess never calls enough or get mad at my dad anymore for having too many projects going while not finishing the ones she wanted him to get done. I got your back, Mom, is what I was saying, and she knew I did. People never worried that I wouldn't do what I said I was going to do, especially in times like these. You don't have to worry about me. The last thing I said to my mother was that this was her time and she was in full control of how quickly she left her body. She was in control. This was her time. This is your time, Mom. It's between you and God. And when I told her this was her time, not ours, I heard a new meaning in that statement for me that I had never understood in the past before. When people say, when it's my time, I don't think they really know what they're talking about. They're saying, when it's my time, they mean like the exact minute or day that you'll die, whether death is unexpected or not. But that's not what it means. When it's your time, that is exactly what it means. It's yours and not anybody else's. It's like your birthday. It's about you and how you feel about how you lived your life. And it's about you and what you think about other people. You get to be just as you want yourself to be and you get to do it on your own terms without fear of what others might think of you nor care for anyone else's feelings. It's your time. You'll cry if you want to, and you'll walk out of your body and run towards the light on your own goddamn time because it's your time. So, end of that blog. The next day, I remember taking my dad into the ICU's small lounge area for friends and family of the patients. I made my dad get my brother on the phone. He hadn't boarded the plane from Houston to Sacramento yet. And I told them that mom wanted to die. And I told them that mom was most definitely going to die and that there was nothing they could do about it. My dad cried at first, but then he got angry. He had been told by the doctor that mom's vitals were doing great and better. And they were. And that mom was expected to make a full recovery in time. My brother was furious at me for making my dad cry. And of course, he also thought that mom was going to be okay and that I was just being my overly dramatic self, as my mom had also been when she wrote, I want to die. After I told my dad that mom was going to pass, dad said he would go against the DNR if he had to for my mom's own good. But I told him that it would not matter. And then he got madder and sadder. The next morning, my cousins Jill and Nicole had arrived just in time to see my mom alive and well, albeit with an intubation tube down her throat and feeding tubes stuck into her veins. They were also on time to join in on the morning's in-person daily medical update from the three doctors and my dad, along with the intuitive nurse who showed me mom's note. Dad, Jill, Nicole, and I listened to the three doctors tell us that mom's emergency stomach surgery was a success. They informed us that the infection from the rupture was clearing from her system in a phenomenally expedient pace for a woman her age. She was responding to all the antibiotics and medication, all of mom's other functions other than her sewn together and diverged intestines, such as her heart, her kidneys, her liver, and everything else, were all working optimally. One of the doctors said he would personally remove the colostomy bag in about six months on the house. Yeah, because he knew we could have sued him for making me feed her to death. By the way, my dad never sued them. Instead of rolling my eyes and interrupting my mother's doctors, I stood with my family patiently. And when my dad, my cousins all breathed sighs of relief and began to thank the doctors for that morning's uplifting data, I spoke up. Uh, please don't leave just yet, I said as I cleared my throat, just as everyone in the room was beginning to adjourn and leave the room. I'm sorry to tell all of you, but my mother is going to die today. I looked over to the nurse. She wasn't rooting me on, but she had a look in her gaze that gave me a little bit of support, the support I needed. I know this sounds weird, I started to explain, especially after what you doctors just told us. But mom said she wanted to die, and I talked to her about that, so... 
My dad tried to cut me off. He was angry again, and my cousins were probably stunned. The doctor then started to repeat to me what they had already just told all of us, but they started to reword everything in a way so that I knew that they thought I was just an over-emotional son of their patient. They wanted to cut me off by sounding reassuring before I became a difficult family member. No, you don't understand, I said, cutting off one and all of the doctors who most assuredly had decided I was indeed difficult. You also don't know my mother. When she says she wants to die, she will. She's really strong that way. And it doesn't matter what you say her body is capable of. I know what she's capable of. When my dad asked me to please stop talking, I pointed out mom's lifelong mantra, her prayers, if you will. Haven't you heard her say all of her life, I never want to grow old, or I never want to have pain, and I never want to have a colostomy bag? Everything up to this point in her life has led to this. She will never grow old. She's in pain, and she has a colostomy bag. It's not your choice. She made that choice a long time ago, and she's sticking to it. There were more grumblings at me from my family and certainly a few more attempts from those doctors to convince me that I was wrong and would I please shut the fuck up, but not in so many words. I shut up and then my family went into my mother's room. Excerpt from day 50 of original blog, 50 days of 50. Today I told my dad what I said to my mother yesterday. And then over the phone, I told my brother, and then I told my cousin Jill everything that I said to my mother yesterday as well. I think that everyone was in their own heads about the situation. They still had hope that mom was going to stay and that her body was going to heal. My cousins Jill and Nicole made it on time, so they joined in the powwow with me and my dad and the doctors. There was so much optimism discussed about my mom being able to have the strength to lick this, and I appreciated that. But at the end of the talk, I explained to my dad, the doctors, and anyone who thought differently that there was nothing that they could do. Mom was leaving. When dad was able to hear it from me, I said, have you met mom? She's always said that she never wanted to get old. She's too vain to wear a colostomy bag, and she thinks that this is her time, and I don't think it's in anyone's hands but hers. He knew how she worked. It had to sink in because he loved her. Fifty years together. This is not lost on me. I hear you, fate. Ha ha ha. You get me. Fifty days, fifty. The doctors were the ones who were adamantly disagreeing with me. They said that my mom was actually recovering by the looks of what was on their clipboards. I was kind and gentle with my words, but I did say, you've only experienced my mom when she wasn't opposing you, so I'm just going to say that it's out of your hands. You'll see. And mom was doing great, and the infections were clearing. She was responding well. Fittingly, my dad was with my mom when she woke up for the last time for her last day in her body. They had a heart to heart. Then she shut her eyes and her body started to speedily and calmly shut down. The doctors were stupefied. First her kidneys went and then the heart became irregular. Within a few hours, there was no fighting to have the doctors remove the equipment or stop feeding mom through tubes. They just did it. The doctors indeed agreed that Marie Elsher was dying. They said it would take about three days for her to pass but I didn't think my mom was going to be a slow runner. There were four of us in the room when my mom passed out of her body. It was the most beautiful, quiet thing I have ever experienced. One moment, we were all talking about her, and the next minute, I noticed that it was very still in the room. Mom must have found that little girl, and they must have giggled in joy having run for that door. She ran into the light, and she did not look back. Mom was so good, I thought. So strong. I was proud of her. Now that's the end of that blog. A funny thing happened on the way to ending this episode. Uh, It's too long. And so I'm just going to stop here. And I believe it's my mom going, it's too long. Just cut it in half and move on to the next episode. So I'm going to do that. In the next episode, I'll bring up the chat GPT um, conversation I had about the guilt I carried. And maybe this 
podcast is helping me through that. And I will tell you about my mom's funeral, how I did not want it to be about me and why, and how my mother helped me do that. So thank you for listening. I'll see you in the next episode.